You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. Mm-hmm. You ever get a song stuck in your head and you can't get it out? It just plays and plays. Don't go nuking hurricanes, baby. Yeah, I'm having that problem right now. Anyway, I, I don't want to talk about him. I think I can safely speak for all of you, all of me, and all of everyone at the G7 when I say there's only so much of him I can take. So let's talk about the orgasm gap instead. The orgasm gap, something he's doubtless contributed to but has not yet attempted to claim credit for. Anyway, while 95% of straight men report climaxing during their last sexual encounter, only 65% of straight women can say the same about their last sexual encounter. And since straight men and straight women are having their sexual encounters with each other, there's a gap, a 30-point orgasm gap. And yeah, guys, that's not good. Now, sex doesn't always have to end with an orgasm to be fulfilling or meaningful or intimate or hot. I've had some amazing sex without getting off. But I'm guessing most, if not all, of the 5% of straight men who didn't climax during their last sexual encounters were disappointed. And the same can probably be said for most, if not all, of the 35% of straight women who didn't climax during their last sexual encounters. And since straight men and straight women are likely to have their sexual encounters with the same partners over and over again, since straight people are likelier to be monogamous, a lot of women are permanently stuck in that 35%. So what can we do to close the orgasm gap? Well, women could give up on men. There's a much smaller quote-unquote orgasm gap in same-sex relationships. Lesbian and bi women with same-sex partners report getting off 86% of the time with the lesbian and bi women that they're with also getting off 86% of the time. So if women could choose to be lesbian, it would go a long way to evening up, closing, or erasing the orgasm gap. And really, if they could choose lesbianism, they would. Your Honor, I'd like to enter into evidence Newt Gingrich and Rudy Giuliani. Case closed. Lesbianism isn't a choice. Why no orgasm gap in women's same-sex relationships? Well, women know from women's bodies. Women are invested in providing pleasure to others, socialized to provide, to meet needs. Women are more giving. Women are socialized to be as entitled or selfish or loudish as men. All true. But there's another factor, a physiological factor, a biological factor, one that could be more easily controlled for than, say, how we socialize men. Timing. Sex researcher, columnist, and regular Lovecast guest Justin Lay Miller recently took a look at the average time it takes straight men and straight women to reach orgasm. And guess what, straight men and straight women? If you're starting at the same time and hoping to finish at the same time, you're doing it wrong. And straight guys, if you and your female partner are starting at the same time and you're both finishing at the same time, odds are good that you finished and she faked. The data show that most straight men come between five to six minutes after the PIV commences and women. It takes women on average 13.4 minutes to come, and I quote, when women had an intense desire for sex in the presence of erotic stimuli. Not just the presence of PIV. This tells us something we already know. Most women can't come from PIV alone. Women need intense focus clitoral stimulation in order to come. Some women can get that kind of clitoral stimulation from PIV alone, but the overwhelming majority cannot. But the data also tells us something else we should bear in mind, all of you people in your opposite sex relationships that never work out. Don't bring the dick in until... Well, not the end, but until she's been getting that erotic stimuli she needs for at least nine minutes, if not more. The longer you delay penetration in your opposite sex relationships, the longer you wait before you stick your dick in her, gentlemen, the longer you make him wait before allowing him to stick his dick in you, gentlewomen, the likelier you both are to get off in the end. All right, coming up on today's show on the micro free edition of the Savage Lovecast, tons of your cues, lots of my A's, and on the Magnum subscription edition of the Savage Lovecast that you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com. The subscription show is twice as long. There are no ads, and your subscription gets you access to every single Savage Lovecast ever recorded. 
on the Magnum, E. Jean Carroll, author and advice columnist, joins us to discuss her new book, What Do We Need Men For? A Modest Proposal, and to take some of your calls with me. All of that coming up on today's show. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Thread Up, the world's largest online resale store where you can buy and sell secondhand clothing. For a limited time, get up to 50% off your first order when you go to threadup.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Honey, the smart shopping assistant that saves you time and money when you're shopping online. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Bowl and Branch, luxury, affordable, fair trade certified sheets. Get 50 bucks off a set of sheets plus free shipping by going to bowlandbranch.com and entering Savage. Hey, Dan. This is a queer guy from the East Coast. Um, I have a question for you about romance or lack thereof. I identify very strongly as a romantic in the sort of specific sense of I know I don't desire or want long-term romantic relationships. I know that I was married once. Uh, I found it very alienating. I divorced and I'm very happily single, very delightfully single. I, I sort of embrace that, love that. And I know that I don't want to be in a relationship. However, what I find is that I do love that new relationship energy that poly folks talk about so much. It's so entrancing. It is so intoxicating and I know that I don't want to persist in it in the long term in a relationship with anybody and I don't seek after it because it wouldn't be fair to anybody to essentially give off the idea that I am available for a romantic relationship because again I find that so deeply alienating from myself so how does somebody go through the world wanting and desiring and loving that new relationship energy, that connection, that magic, that spark that is so enriching while acknowledging that I don't look for that permanently. I don't look for that long-term. I don't look for that in a long-term romantic relationship. I love being by myself. I treasure my friendships. I treasure my autonomy. But God, I love that new relationship energy. Is there any threading of this needle, Dan? You are available for romantic relationships. You are interested in romantic relationships. Just very, very short-term romantic relationships. You dig that NRE. You like having a fling. You like having a crush on someone. And you like then... Getting out of that relationship, being single and finding a new person to have a fling with and a brand new crush on and experience that NRE with. And luckily for you, you're a gay guy and it's going to be easier for you to churn through dudes and find dick and find guys for those flings because gay men are easy. Not because they're gay men, as we've covered before and often and frequently. Gay men aren't easier to get in bed because they're gay men. They're easier to get in bed because they're gay men and men don't have to factor violence into their romantic or sexually impulsive calculations to the same extent that women do. It's not that men are incapable of inflicting sexual violence on other men and intimate partner violence on other men. Men can, and they do, but not at the rate that patriarchy and misogyny and paranoia and fear and control seem to prompt men to inflict that kind of gendered to a large extent violence on women. So yeah, dark digression there going to be easy for you. Just be honest about who you are and what you want and what you don't want. Tell guys you meet that you have a crush on, that you experience NRE with, that NRE is basically all you're interested in, that you love to have these short-term passionate affairs. You might want to work on, if this isn't a skill you already possess, transitioning your lovers to friends so that there is something in it for them, a long and lasting friendly connection. But don't allow people to make assumptions about your intentions or what you're capable of that you know not to be true. If something long-term just absolutely positively is not in the cards, be upfront about that. And maybe you'll meet guys who just want the NRE that you want. Maybe you'll meet guys in long-term committed relationships, guys in marriages who are seeking NRE outside their long-term committed relationship. 
you say uh, at the end of your call that you're not looking for NRE long term. NRE does not exist long term. Long term and NRE, new relationship energy, are mutually exclusive. There is long term relationship energy and it can be rewarding and satisfying in very different ways. But it's never quite that giddy high of NRE. So yeah, not only can't you have NRE long term, no one can have NRE long term. And there are a lot of people out there who have committed partners at home who are looking for what you're selling outside their relationship. That jolt, that injection of NRE, that's what they want to experience. And you can provide it for them. You can be the Florence fucking Nightingale of gay dick down dude NRE. Hi, Dan. This is a female on the West Coast in the late 20s calling. So I'm in a really wonderful long-term relationship with a partner. He and I have been together for over five years, and we've gone through a lot, a long-distance relationship, as well as moving across the country together. And we have an amazing relationship, but my job had me moving or um, traveling a lot. And because of that, we opened up our relationship about a year ago, and opening it up was awesome. You know, we both got to do what we wanted to do when we weren't together. However, we've since uh, relocated to the West Coast from the East Coast and kind of changed the terms of our openness because I don't travel as much due to the relocation, which is amazing, except now I'm kind of going through the cycle of trying to understand uh, potentially my bisexuality. I found that when I do travel, uh, it's so much easier to hook up with dudes than it is to hook up with girls. Girls are more picky and they seem to be more choosy, which brings me to the fact that men are easier, but I just thought that the guy that was just so um like just a terrible like I just can't get over the fact that it's just so selfish and so like porn-esque and even though I use my words and said please go slower please slow down it just doesn't even matter sometimes it feels like men are conditioned to be able to kind of get away with whatever they want to get from sex and just trying to grapple with the whole dynamic of having the freedom but yet having my desire be kind of held back by what's available and what's the lowest hanging fruit. So I'm just, I guess, trying to reach out in a sense of <laughs> understanding what's going on in the, dy- the dynamic of how women can be, you know, so much more difficult to try to connect with and go out and, and try to, you know, potentially go home with, whereas men are easier, which is great, except they are just selfish in the way that they you know, have sex with you, especially when it's kind of understood that it's a one night thing and it's not going to lead to anything further. So just curious if you have any advice for me since I'm trying to explore my bisexuality, but also just horny in general and have a high libido. And I want to, I just want to be able to understand how to navigate through this. Men are indeed, as I told the previous caller, easier, less concerned about violence. Men also feel entitled to what they want sexually. And so are likelier to seek it out, jump in, accept the offer when made. And there are a lot of lousy lays out there. And people can be less considerate of partners that they don't think they're ever going to see again. I've had plenty of sex with men over the course of my life. I've had sex with men that I didn't think I was ever going to see again and men who didn't think they were ever going to see me again. And yeah, that can induce a certain kind of selfishness in the act and in consideration in the act. And it took me a long time to learn that, well, you should leave people in better shape than you found them and that everything is a relationship, whether it's a long, long, long term relationship, whether you're together for years or whether you're together just for hours, it's still a relationship and you have to be decent and kind and solicitous, even in the context of that short term relationship. <sighs> so these bad men out there, these shitty, selfish men out there, you know, when someone begins to show you who they are, I'm leaning into this Maya Angelou quote all the time lately, but when someone shows you who they are or they just begin to show you who they are, you can pull your pants up and leave. You can go sticking around for what you now know is going to be an unrewarding sexual encounter. Yeah, you don't need to do that. Now, some women feel they have no choice to do that because they're afraid if they get up and go, the guy is going to react badly, perhaps react violently. And so you have to make your best judgment in the moment and protect yourself in the moment. And unfortunately, men being what so many men are, there are women who in the moment appear to be offering their consent, but it's consent under duress because they fear worse than the shitty sex that they are having or about to have. And so they stick around. 
make your judgment call in the moment. If you are having sex and it is not good or he's not good or he's not skilled at making out with you or is just being a dick or a shit or has sent up the flares that let you know that whatever else is going to happen tonight is going to be lousy and you feel safe leaving, fucking leave. Maybe then he'll learn a lesson and make an effort with the next woman that he's with even for a few hours to be a better and more considerate lover. As for women, yeah, it's harder to get women in bed, even harder for women to get women in bed. Women are less likely to be impulsive. They're not socialized to feel as entitled as men feel. And women are always factoring in risk in a way that men aren't. So you're going to have to borrow a page from the kinksters, someone who's into crazy kinks, who's going on a business trip. They can't just walk into a bar and pick somebody up who shares their kinks because that all has to be hashed out well in advance. You've got to make that date. So what I would encourage you to do when you know you're going on a trip is to get on the apps in that area and start looking for by lesbian, by curious, lesbian women are open to being the piece on the side or the piece on vacation. Women well in advance of your trip. Be your own advance team. Do your legwork and set that same sex, girl on girl, by curious date up well in advance, just like any kinkster would. My beloved listeners, are your sheets as soft and luxurious as you deserve? If you're lucky enough to have someone in your bed with you, or even if you're flying solo, you deserve and your partners deserve the best sheets you can possibly put on your bed. And we all know by now who makes those sheets, BowlandBranch.com. Everything Bowl and Branch makes from bedding to blankets is made from pure 100% organic cotton, which means they start out super soft and they get even softer over time. You buy directly from them, so you're essentially paying wholesale prices. Luxury sheets can cost up to $1,000 in the store, but Bowl and Branch sheets are only a couple of hundred bucks. Everyone who tries Bowl and Branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews. And Bowl and Branch uses only sustainable and responsible methods of sourcing and manufacturing, and they donate a portion of every sale to a charity that helps fight human trafficking while preserving fair prices for consumers. Shipping is free, and you can try them for 30 nights. If you don't love them, you can send them back for a refund. I doubt you're going to want to send them back, but there's no risk and therefore no reason why you shouldn't give Bowl & Branch a try. To get you started, right now my listeners get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com when you use the promo code SAVAGE. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com, promo code SAVAGE. bowlandbranch.com, promo code SAVAGE. Hey Dan, um, I have a statement here, not a question, sorry. I just want to say, after trawling the various dating apps and meeting and talking to a lot of men and women, can I just say... It is absolute bullshit that there are still so many people out there who won't date, in particularly men who are shorter. I think that is the most fucking like superficial bullshit ever because I just feel like that's tied up in society's traditional idea of what a man should be and what masculinity is and that or a man has to be tall and, and brooding. I just think... I don't know, women who, well, heterose- heterosexual women who don't want to date dudes that are shorter than them, and that seems to be like the only turn off to them. I feel like you have got to be such a superficial piece of shit. I'm sorry. And by the same token, I think it's also bullshit that really tall women cop a lot of flack as well, um, who maybe date men who are shorter and feel insecure about it and then, you know, make their girlfriend or whoever whoever they're dating, you know, feel bad. Like, that's also bullshit. Like, because it also plays into the same idea of what society's, you know, image of femininity is meant to be. I just feel like, I don't even know why I'm angry. People need to get over themselves. That is a constant theme around here. Yeah, that the guy's got to be taller thing is tied up in societal attitudes about what a man should be. It's it's also tied up in a lot of women's attitudes about how they want to feel in the sexual context. They want to feel feminine, which unfortunately is conflated with feeling small, more vulnerable, protected. And so a lot of women want that bigger guy. It is frustrating and it is bullshit in my opinion. And it's one of the reasons I'm glad I'm gay. I'm going to put it right there on the list. It's probably the 444th reason on the list at this point. But, you know, in a same-sex relationship, someone's going to be taller, someone's going to be shorter, and you can't tie it 
to sex or gender, just somebody's going to be taller, somebody's going to be shorter. I'm six one. Terry's six foot tall. Doesn't matter. I've dated guys who are a foot shorter than me. I've dated guys who are eight inches taller than me. I didn't feel any less a man. Of course, to come out as gay, you have to let go of those kinds of hang-ups about what a man should be and how a man should feel and what a man should want. And it's funny how in straight land, you hear about this a lot. You hear about this relative height thing constantly. And short guys complain about being overlooked. <laughs> Sorry. And tall women complain about not being desired or insecure men feeling emasculated by their height. And you know what I never hear in a gay bar? You know what I never hear when my gay friends get together and talk? I never hear anybody talking about this. I mean, we talk about all sorts of things, but this never comes up. It is a non-issue over here in gay land, which is why I'm happy to be a citizen. And yes, caller, seconding you here, straight people really need to get over this shit. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is sponsored by Honey. Honey is a free browser extension that scans the web for coupon codes and discounts while you're shopping online. Honey automatically applies the biggest savings to your cart at checkout. It's like magic. It works on over 20,000 sites like Amazon, Nordstrom, J. Crew, Nike, Best Buy, Target, Macy's, and more. It takes zero effort to install, just two clicks, and you'll start saving anytime you shop online. Here's what some of their users have had to say. They call it Honey because all of them sweet deals. And I totally thought Honey was a scam, but I just got 300 bucks worth of bathing suits for $180. You might think it sounds too good to be true, like it's free and it saves me money. What's the catch? It's actually really simple. When you use a coupon provided by Honey, they earn a small commission from the merchant and they pass along some of the savings to their members. So it's a win-win for everybody. Nancy just used Honey to buy some musical gear for herself online, and she tells me she got a big discount she wouldn't have known about if it weren't for Honey. There's really no reason not to use Honey. It's free to use and easy to install on your computer in just two clicks. Don't take it from me. Take it from Nancy. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash savage. That's joinhoney.com slash savage. Honey, online savings simplified. Hey, I'm going to leave this one pretty anonymous. Uh, what happens if you are into uh, incest porn and your partner has been molested by somebody in their family? Curveball, yeah. If it's triggering for your partner to have this rubbed in her face... You keep your fucking mouth shut about it and you cover your tracks and you delete your browser histories and you demonstrate consideration and care for your partner's safety uh, and comfort. But you don't have to feel guilty about this. People's kinks are randomly assigned. Most people into incest porn, the overwhelming majority, and it is one of the top search terms on all porn sites it is a common kind of squicked out fucking transgressive fantasy it's probably a common fantasy because it's so squicky and transgressive people who are into this usually aren't into actual family members certainly not into sexual abuse or rape Oy. so yeah you don't have to feel guilty about it but you do have to be considerate of your partner's comfort safety you don't want to trigger your partner and so if this is on the table, if this has come up and it's been discussed, you can emphasize why this turns you on. You can emphasize that you didn't ask for this to turn you on. You can emphasize that you're never going to ask your partner to role play this and that you will create a zone of plausible deniability where she can, if possible, just forget that this is one of your kinks or one of your turn-ons. And then keep your mouth shut and cover your tracks. Now, in some cases, it is a libido killer for person A to know that person B is turned on by thing Z. And if that's how your partner feels, well, then you have to accept that with good grace and just acknowledge that your kink makes you sexually incompatible, that this isn't something that she can not think about, that however big a zone of plausible deniability you endeavor to create for her, that this will always weigh on her mind and she may not feel safe with you as a partner. And that's sad, but that happens. 
And if that happens, well, then you accept it with good grace and you move on and find a partner who isn't going to be triggered by your kinks in the same way that if indeed it comes to pass that you two can't be together because of this, who isn't triggered in the same way that your potential future ex was. Did you guys know that 26 billion pounds of clothes are thrown out each year and that 95% of all that clothing could have been recycled or reused? The textile waste problem is huge and buying and selling secondhand clothes provides such an easy solution. ThreadUp is the world's largest online resale store where you can buy and sell secondhand clothing. They make it super easy to clean out and restock your wardrobe affordably. If you like the idea of thrifting, but you don't have the time to dig through racks of clothes that aren't in your size or style, you have to check out ThreadUp. They have literally transformed the thrifting game. You can filter by almost anything, size, brand, style, color, even condition. You can also save searches and your favorite items that you have your eye on. It's quick and easy to find what you love from all the top brands like Banana Republic and Taylor, Lululemon, and more, and items are up to 90% off estimated retail. Along with all the great deals you can score while shopping at ThreadUp, they're an amazing resource to clean out your closet and to prevent you from contributing to all that textile waste. Simply order a free cleanout kit online, fill it up with your items, and send it back. ThreadUp takes care of everything else. You'll earn a little cash or credit for what sells, and the rest is responsibly reused or recycled it's so easy. Whether you're looking to freshen up your wardrobe for fall, shopping for back to school, or just want to get some new trendy pieces, ThreadUp is the perfect solution for your wallet and for the planet. For a limited time, ThreadUp is offering my listeners up to 50% off your first order when you go to threadup.com slash savage. That's on top of the already low prices. So hurry and take advantage. That's ThreadUp, T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash savage. Savage, threadup.com slash savage for up to 50% off select items today. Terms apply. Hi, Dan. I'm a 30-year-old gay man with a new boyfriend uh, a few years younger than me. Uh, We have fallen in love quickly. Um, Love being around each other and are extremely passionate. When we met a few weeks ago, I told him I'm a verse bottom who can top sometimes. He is a verse top. So far, I have topped him once, and he has topped me tons of times. All amazing sessions for both. Yesterday, he wanted to top. I, he wanted me to top him, so I tried and did it for a while. But he could, he could tell that I am not really wired that way, which got him very upset. He nearly cried. He feels I wasn't upfront enough that I am not really averse at all. He revealed that since he is so hung, he has in the past felt objectified and uh, by people who just fall in love with his amazing cock. But I really love him as a human. I have been taking small doses of Cialis daily to be able to top, which works kind of. My boyfriend wasn't happy, though, when I told him that I was using using it. I apologized and reaffirmed our commitment. We both reaffirmed our commitment to each other, but I now know how strong his desire is to sometimes bottom. Even though he's a great top who loves to pound, he doesn't want to play with others, and toys aren't enough. He doesn't want to strap on in him. What can we do, Dan? We're making plans for the future, but long run, this isn't going away. Hey there, caller in the throes of NRE, new relationship energy. Making plans for the future, are you? Sorry, <laughs> he's such an asshole about this. You met him a few weeks ago. You've fallen quickly. I get it. We all fantasize in the new relationship energy stage about this person potentially being not the one, but one of the ones out there that we could spend the rest of our lives with. And if things continue to be as great as they are now, oh my God, what a great and fabulous life that would be. I would encourage you right now just to take a deep breath and slow your roll. And I would encourage you and your boyfriend, at least right now, to lean into the sex that's working for you, which is him pounding your ass and put a pin in the fact that he also likes to be pounded himself every once in a while. And he doesn't want every sexual encounter with you. If you guys are sexually exclusive or with the whole world, if you guys aren't sexually exclusive, not that people aren't sexually exclusive, sleep with everybody in the whole world, but he doesn't want every sexual encounter to revolve around his giant dick. And so he has other erogenous zones that he wants attention paid to. And you can put a pin in that and say, like, let's 
catch a groove. Let's do the stuff that's working for us right now with the understanding that that's not all we're ever going to do. You're under a lot of pressure right now and downing Cialis daily right now at age 30 to come through with the hard dick to fuck him. And you know, being under pressure in a circumstance like that, it's not very arousing. You need to get to a point where you really want to fuck him. And it may be that in a relationship with a verse bottom and a verse top that you want to fuck him once every couple of dozen times he fucks you that what's fun and sexy about it eventually is that you're flipping your usual script and in a few weeks in you haven't written your script yet so there's nothing to flip here so i think you're both getting out over your skis a little bit he prefers to top you prefer to bottom that can be the foundation on which you build a sexual relationship where you sometimes top and he sometimes bottoms but you're both kind of hurrying each other here he's really into you too he wants it to work out so maybe he's feeling a little bit anxious about needing to be reassured that if you guys do commit to each other and you're together for the long term that his hole isn't going to be neglected and it's not going to be all about his dick and what i would say to him if he was listening and maybe you should play it for him is give it some time and it will very likely emerge you, know, it, it, you guys will catch a groove where again you're mostly bottoming, he's mostly topping, but he is sometimes bottoming and you are sometimes topping. But without a lot of pressure and without uh, you know, him demanding that you prove to him now, just a few weeks in, where you can provide him with the experiences bottoming that he also wants to. I think if you took the pressure off, allow yourselves to be who you are most of the time, most of the time with each other, you will feel more comfortable topping him and you will top him occasionally. And it'll be good for you both if you don't rush it. Enjoy the NRE, enjoy what's working right now and look to the future with an expectation that more will work for you guys as your sexual rapport deepens. Hey Dan, straight guy calling from Western PA. I've gone through a breakup recently uh about a month ago and it's been pretty rough we we broke up about a month ago and then we agreed that it'd probably be best if we gave each other space and didn't talk to each other for a week so that happened and then well we just started talking and we got to talking every day and uh, she and we ended up hooking up this past monday and now i saw her today and now things are over over just definitely over um she's going to law school she said that she doesn't want to bring a messy relationship into a new chapter in her life and i understand and i'm not calling to ask how to get her back because that's not going to happen uh, i'm just calling to ask how do i work through this i mean she is absolutely amazing and i feel like i'm going to be hard pressed to to find uh somebody in the future that's on her level how do you work through this well first you feel the fuck out of your feelings and it sounds like you're feeling the fuck out of your feelings sounds like you're very in touch with your feelings so good job so far you hurt, you eat a lot of ice cream, you go to the gym, you talk to your friends, you blah, blah, blah about your pain and about the loss that you're experiencing right now. At a certain point, you're going to want them to intervene, change the subject, push you out of the grief process and make you run around, go out, hang out, do things, leave the house and stop sitting with your pain. It's fine right now to sit with your pain, to really wallow. But you can't wallow forever. The problem with a heartbreak and with getting dumped when you don't want to get dumped is that you can really spiral down uh, into a wallow that becomes a never-ending wallow. And you don't want to do that. And, and, and you don't want to let yourself do that. And But sometimes we can't pull ourselves out of that. We need our friends to grab us by the neck and pull us up and pull us out and take us out and then tell us if we start in, I know that was my girlfriend or my ex-boyfriend's favorite drink, to shut the fuck up about our ex and look around and see all the future potential girlfriends and boyfriends in the room and of course future potential ex-boyfriends and girlfriends in the room. But yeah, it's sad. My, my heart goes out to you. 
and God rip out my tongue for saying this, but law school isn't the French foreign legion. She's not going to disappear forever. I don't want you to live in false hope. You have to conduct yourself now like this relationship is over and you're never going to see her again and get out there in the world and meet new people. But sometimes it's a comfort. So long as it doesn't paralyze you, so long as it doesn't keep you sitting at home alone, waiting and wallowing, for some people it can be a comfort. It can be freeing to say to themselves, who knows where we're going to be in five or 10 years. We might run into each other again. We might reconnect at a point later in life where I'm in a better place. She's in a better place. We've both matured to a point where the relationship, if it resumes, isn't going to be quite as messy as it was at this stage in our lives. And who knows in the interim, if this ever happens and it might not, I'm going to get out there and date other people. I'm going to get out there and live my life, which is exactly what she's doing. I'm going to go do that. It's fine to live with hope. Just don't be paralyzed by hope. And you may find yourself two years from now, after having you know, lived with that false comfort in a relationship with someone new, and three or four months into that relationship, you'll realize that you haven't even thought of your ex in all that time. And then you'll know you're well and truly over her, and you can let go then of that false hope. What you now know was false hope that helped you get up off your ass and out of the house. Hi, Dan, sexy voice Nancy and the tech savvy at risk youth. Uh, I'm a 28 year old cis heterosexual woman, and I've got a quick question about dating behavior. This is a pattern that's been coming up a lot this summer. It's something that's happened before, but this summer it's just particularly happening more. I'm going on good, solid first dates, maybe not out of the park amazing first dates, but decent first dates where I want to see the guy again. And then they are spurring on these kind of impromptu, spontaneous second date proposals. I want to clarify, I don't think they're booty calls, but they could just be booty calls in disguise. Uh, So for example, I had a man message me 10 in the morning. Hey, what are you up to? Do you want to go grab breakfast together? I'm going to be in your neighborhood. Or, you know, late on a Saturday night, hey, do you want to go grab ice cream together? I'm heading to your neighborhood right now. And you know, they're, they're really turning me off. I'm wondering, you know, why why people think a spontaneous kind of second date is going to work. So analyzing why it turns me off, I think I am a spontaneous person, but I'm spontaneous with people I know and I trust. So if you can provide some insights as to why someone might think a spontaneous second date is going to be successful, or if any of your colleagues can provide insight as to why they might do that, I'd be really interested to know. I guess I don't see the problem here. You go out on a formal first date. I assume they sent the footman around with their card and you arrange that first date. And then they're in the neighborhood to buy your house. They're thinking of you and might like to grab breakfast and have a second date that isn't quite as formal. Definitely not a booty call. No one rolls their booty call out with a 10 a.m. invitation to go out and have biscuits and gravy. So the guy that you had a good first date with and established some sort of rapport with and you felt good enough about to either let him know roughly where you live or good enough about to have him round to where you live, figures they'll give you a shout because they're going to be in your neighborhood and they'd like to see you again. Honestly, I don't see the problem. You say you're fine with spontaneous plans and you're a spontaneous person, but only with people that you know and trust. Well, these guys who are contacting you after the successful first date with these impromptu plans for ice cream or breakfast, they're not asking you to do something dangerous with them. Breakfast, not, hey, let, let's go to that new escape room down the block where we'll be locked in for hours and hours and hours and see if we can get out. No, they're just asking you out for breakfast. On the assumption, you ask why would people assume that they could make these kinds of calls and these kind of impromptu plans, I think these guys are operating under the assumption that You don't have this particular stick in your ass, but you do. And if this is something that you've noticed happening regularly, you might want to get out in front of the stick in your ass, not pull it out, just get out in front of it and tell these guys on your first date that, you know, until you really know somebody and really trust them after a few dates, you like to keep it kind of formal, make plans in advance, at least a couple of days in advance. And then they'll know not to call you about having breakfast. You risk, however, them never calling you again about anything. Hey, Dan. Female straight here. In my late 20s, my boyfriend is in his mid-20s. The problem is my boyfriend says that he is depressed 
obviously I want to help him do what I can for him. Uh, the thing is, one of the reasons he brings up the most is that nobody talks to him, um, including me. The deal with that is when I do try to talk to him, it's typically about topics that he doesn't care about. Uh, for instance, I tend to, or I used to, talk a lot about work, and he has zero interest in talking about work uh, because he he hates his job, basically. And other times when I feel like we do have decent conversations, I find out later when he is at his peak upsetness that they didn't count somehow as meaningful conversations. So I find myself silent around him quite a bit, worried about what to say, how to say it, because he may not like it. And so I usually just find me that staying silent is best, but he hates the silence. It drives him crazy. And when he does get driven crazy, he'll have these moments of, well, what feel like rant to me. He'll go on for hours about how he does everything for other people and no one does the same for him. I feel like he just really doesn't understand me and I do try. When he is on these rants, I am even less inclined to say anything, which bothers him even more because I just don't know how to respond to, um, it's not like intense anger, but he's clearly just very upset and I don't know how to respond to that. And I try talking to him about that and he just doesn't think that. Okay, okay, I'm just gonna break in here dump the motherfucker already what does this guy bring to your life except paralysis silence self-scrutiny and these awful rants he goes on he's not your problem he's obviously not in good working order and you have begun to edit yourself in really crazy ways so as not to set him off and that's a kind of emotional abuse when someone blows the fuck up at you randomly or regular intervals about things that make very little sense which prompts you then to self-censor and walk around on eggshells yeah that's a kind of emotional abuse he's kind of torturing you and what sort of a future do you imagine yourself having with this man sometimes you just need to step back and ask yourself can i take four more decades of this and if the answer is no you gotta go. So call her. I don't want to be like your boyfriend. In a way, I'm kind of being like your boyfriend here. I'm telling you to shut up, but shut up already about how awful this guy is. And he sounds awful and your dynamic sounds terrible and it doesn't sound like it brings either of you pleasure. And get out. Dump the motherfucker already. Instead of telling you you can do better, but I do think that you can do better, I'm going to tell you what Joan Price said wisely on this show many years ago. It is better to be alone because you're alone than alone because you're with the wrong person. And you are very alone and isolated in the cone of silence that you exist in when you are with this person who is wrong for you, doesn't make you happy. And you perhaps are wrong for him too. Doesn't sound like you make him happy. Doesn't sound like anyone makes him happy. And you are not nailed to the floor which means you are free to go. And you, you say that he's depressed and this comes up frequently. People wind up feeling like they can't dump someone who's depressed because they're abandoning them at a bad time in their life. But it is often the case that getting dumped, hitting rock bottom, as they say, at least relationship and romance wise, is what inspires someone who needs help to go get that help. And your continued presence in his life is the impediment, is what's preventing him from seeing that he needs help. So don't feel guilty when you dump him and you leave. It may be, in the end, in the final accounting, the best thing that ever happened to him. It'll certainly be, in the immediate accounting, the best thing that's happened to you in a long time. All right, before we get to your response calls, let's read some tweets. William Hay tweets, 
Hey, Dan Savage, glad you endorsed the HPV vaccine on the last hashtag Savage Lovecast. But you need to know that the U.S. FDA recently expanded their recommendation to include all adults between the ages of 27 and 45. Thanks for that. The CDC website I looked at was outdated. 27 to 45, go get your HPV vaccine if you haven't been vaccinated already. And you know what? Older than 45 couldn't hurt to get the HPV vaccine anyway. Everybody should be vaccinated against HPV. Rebecca Atkinson Lord tweets, Hey, at Fake Dan Savage, great to hear a UK specific rant at the top of the latest episode, but you got one thing wrong. Wales voted to leave the EU, not remain, as you said, despite receiving huge subsidies from the EU for agriculture, industry, and social care. Hashtag Savage Lovecast. Thank you, Rebecca. Sorry, I got that wrong. Thank you, Rebecca. Sorry, I got that wrong. It was Scotland and Northern Ireland that voted to stay in the EU. Wales and England voted for the Brexit shit show and what a shit show it is. And finally, Lauren Lance tweets, Hey, Dan, thank you so much for the balanced advice you gave the caller about dating the bisexual woman whose boyfriend has leukemia. As a poly bisexual woman with a male and female partner, hell yes to believe queer women. That really meant a lot to me. Hashtag Savage Lovecast. You're welcome, Lauren, and thank you for your tweet. Meant a lot to me. If you want us to read one of your tweets, potentially, on a future episode of the Savage Lovecast, be sure to include the hashtag Savage Lovecast. And now your response calls. Hi, Dan. I'm calling about the woman whose sister is in an abusive relationship and going back and forth about whether or not she's going to stay. Sometimes people who are on their way out of an abusive relationship will go through this cycle of telling someone they love about it and then going back on their word. They're testing that support system outside of the relationship. And by telling the person that you don't want to hear about it and you're only there if they're willing to take action can actually slow down how quickly they're going to get out of this relationship. So I think better advice would be to detach yourself from the outcome of your sister's relationship. Be there for her, provide unconditional support and love. Even when it's hard, it's easier to not take on those emotions if you're detached from the outcome and loving her the same, whether she's in or out of the relationship. This is something that I went through with my sister, so I really can relate to how you're feeling and how traumatizing it can be to hear that someone you love so much is going through that. But I promise you that if you make this all about her and give her unconditional love and don't make it about yourself, she will see how safe she is outside of this relationship. And one day, one day, that conversation will turn into action. Hi, Dan. I'm calling in response to the woman uh, on your most recent show who was complaining about her incredibly loud roommate making a lot of noise. I think you really, really missed the ball on this one by saying that it's her problem, that she doesn't want her sleep and her work interrupted by someone basically yelling and screaming and crashing around. Yes, the roommate has a right to have sex in her own home, but you have the right to become a trained opera singer. That doesn't mean that you can just start singing La Boheme at three o'clock in the morning. The caller didn't act like she didn't want to ever hear any sex noises at all, which would be unreasonable. She just wanted her roommate to be a little more considerate of, you know, when and how loud she was having sex in a house with very little privacy. So, you know, maybe instead of acting like she was the unreasonable one, maybe, you know, could have said, hey, roommate, if you like to have loud, screamy sex, because that's who you are, maybe you should move out. Greetings, Dan. In response to the sister who called in during episode 669, concerned that her brother was seeking out and pursuing white supremacy ideology and groups, I appreciate you bringing on former white supremacist Christian Pichelini, but his response fell flat and left me frustrated, particularly the fear around ruffling this brother's feathers. I say clip them in the strongest and most conditional way possible, i.e., We stand together as a family. What you are doing is unacceptable. Not sure where you missed the boat on compassion and live, let live for all. But if you want our support financially or emotionally, you must meet our conditions. Go to a Holocaust museum or meet with a survivor. See a member of the clergy and even talk with Mr. Pichelini. Once these are accomplished, we'll talk about where we go as a family, united in love and tolerance. Please skip the kumbaya and dredging up a lifetime of issues. Be tough, and hopefully this misguided and potentially dangerous brother will thank you one day. 
And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you want to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. The Savage Lovecast is going to be live in Chicago, Madison, Minneapolis, Toronto, and Boston this fall. And at the Savage Love Live in Minneapolis, back by popular demand, Stormy Daniels will be joining me on stage. Tickets on sale now for all five cities at savagelovecast.com slash events. In other Savage Industry news, the 15th Annual Hump Opening Film Festival with all the new films for this year's Hump opens in November in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and Olympia for the first time also in Vancouver, B.C. Get your tickets now for the opening festivals at humpfilmfest.com. And audiences in San Francisco, Olympia, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver get to vote and give the Hump Awards. So if you want to say in which films, get the gongs. Go to humpfilmfest.com and get yourself a ticket for one of the opening screenings of this year's Hump Film Festival. And there is still time to make and submit a film for Hump. Show us what turns you on and get a chance to win big cash prizes at Hump. The deadline is September 13th, so get humping now. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow E. Jean Carroll on Twitter at E. Jean Carroll. And please do pick up and read her new book. It is amazing. Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Artuni and, and me and the tech savvy at Risk Youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with an installment of the Savage Lovecast 